Last night we spent quite a bit of time talking about the problem, talking about the physical allergy that ensures we can't safely drink, talking about the obsession of the mind that ensures that we can't keep from drinking. And the ultimate conclusion to that was if you can't safely drink without getting drunk, and if you can't keep from drinking, then you've become absolutely powerless over alcohol, and most certainly our lives have become unmanageable. If not at that time, we just keep on drinking, and after a while they will be for sure. So this morning we're going to look at an example of a guy that had that problem. A good textbook never tells you anything anyhow, but what it don't back it up with more information. And we're going to look at Bill's story this morning. And Bill's story is a classic example of an alcoholic who had the allergy and who had the obsession of the mind. Now, we've got to remember back in the 1930s, Bill learned very early on the value of sharing your story with another alcoholic when he went to see Dr. Bob. And immediately Dr. Bob could see his problem also. They went to see Bill Dotson, and they shared their stories with Bill Dotson. Bill Dotson could see his problem through their stories. And they learned very early on that it was necessary for one alcoholic to identify with another in order to be able to get their interest and get their attention. And when the big book was first published, they knew they wouldn't be able to sit down with the first person out here in California and share their story one-on-one. So the big book had to be complete enough to do that. So they said, we'll put Bill's story in here at the very beginning. And another alcoholic in reading Bill's story will be able to identify with Bill. And if we can identify with Bill and see his alcoholism, see him make a recovery from that condition, we can begin to believe and we can begin to hope that we're enough like Bill Wilson that if he could recover from that condition, then just maybe we could too. Now, a lot of people have said, well, we, don't, we have trouble identifying with Bill Wilson because, after all, he was a night school lawyer and we were not. After all, he was a New York City stock speculator and we were not. And a lot of the women say we can't identify with him because he's a man. And many people say, well, he was an older fellow and we couldn't identify there either. But if we look for the way Bill thinks and the way Bill acts and the way Bill drinks... If we're a real alcoholic, there's not an alcoholic in this room that can identify with Bill Wilson. So as we go through Bill's story this morning, we'll look for identification. We'll look for the progression of alcoholism. We'll look for him drinking finally for the sickest reason of all, complete oblivion. Then we'll look and see how Bill recovered from alcoholism. And if we've identified with him, then we can begin to believe that if he could do it, just maybe we could too. Identification, the beginning of belief, the beginning of hope. Joe? See, I, too, didn't think I could identify with Bill Wilson because I'd seen pictures of him. He was an old man, I thought. It turns out he was uh, 43 years old when this book was written, so a relatively young man. But as I began to study and read Bill's story, I began to see that he was a very optimistic person, hardworking, had lots and lots of willpower. He was a self-made man, became very successful in his own right. And through Bill's story, we're going to see how... He learned uh, how he was, what he was like. Then we're going to see how he uh, learned that he was sick, and then we're going to see how he affected a recovery. So the total story of Alcoholics Anonymous is contained in Bill Wilson's story. So let's go to page one, <clears throat> Bill's story. He said, War fever ran high in the New England town to which we knew young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned, and we were flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. It was love, applause, and war. Moments sublime with intervals hilarious. Anybody ever had any moments sublime with intervals hilarious? <laughs> I have. I love the way Bill writes. He said, I was part of life at last. In the midst of excitement, I discovered liquor. I forgot the strong warnings and prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sailed for over there. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much move, I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a dogger on an old tombstone. Said, here lies a Hampshire grimmeted ear who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier has never forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. Now, when he said or by pot, he's not referring to this wacky weed. (laughs) He's talking about a pot of beer. That's the way they used to drink it over in England at that time. He said, ominous warning, which I failed to heed. Twenty-two in a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. 
I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me special token of appreciation? My talent for leadership, I imagined, would one day place me in the va- head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. He said, I took a night law course and obtained employment as an investigator for the surety company. The drive for success was on. I proved to the world that I was important. I already identify with Bill Wilson. That seems to be one of the main characteristics behind every alcoholic I've ever known. That great drive for success was on. I proved to the world that I'm important also. That seems to be the driving force behind each one of us. He said, my work took me about Wall Street, and little by little I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Well, why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or to write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wives. I can identify with Bill. (laughs) So we had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk. I have no trouble identifying with Bill Wilson. That the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. Charlie said last night we make our living selling fast talks to slow-thinking people, and Bill's trying to do some of that here, but we all know the lawyers didn't buy that. He said, by the time I'd completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. The inviting mail stream of Wall Street had me in its grip. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that will one day turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. Living modestly, my wife and I saved $1,000. It went into certain securities, then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that they would someday have a great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements, but my wife and I decided to go anyway. I had developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. Now, Bill is referring to a time back in the 1920s When the stock market was on a roll, just about everybody that dealt with stocks was making money. All you had to do is buy them and hold on to them, let them go up in price, sell them, take your profits, buy some more. Everything was done on about a 10% margin. Everything was pure speculation. Bill really became one of the first investment counselors on Wall Street. He began to say, look, sooner or later this bubble is going to burst. Sooner or later we're going to have to start making our decisions based on fact rather than speculation. He went to the people who had the money, and he said, I don't have the money to do this, but if you guys would back me financially, I'll leave New York City and I'll start visiting these companies, and I'll look at the plants and I'll talk to the employees and I'll examine the books wherever I can, and I'll write up reports and send them back in here, and we'll start making our decisions whether to buy or not based on fact. And they said, nah, Bill, we don't need that kind of information. We're making about all the money we, might, we want to make anyhow. And you know how we alcoholics are. If we get a good idea, stubborn as hell, we're going to carry it out one way or the other. He said, to hell with them. I don't need them anyhow. I'll just go do this on my own. He said, we gave up our positions, and off we roared on a motorcycle. The sidecar stuff with tent blankets, a change of clothes, three huge volumes of a financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. I had had some success in speculation, so we had a little money. But we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. We covered the whole eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position there and the use of a large expense account. The exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. Bill and Lois, traveling on the motorcycle, living in the tent, went up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States, and he wrote up reports on approximately 100 of the largest companies in the eastern states, sent them into New York City. The guys that had the money saw them, and they said, Oh, yeah, man, this is great information. Immediately they put Bill on the payroll, gave him a large expense account. He exercised an option, made a good profit. For the first time in his life, he's got something. He came from a little town called East Dorset, Vermont. He had never had anything before in his life. Here's how he feels. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. I had arrived. (laughs) 
God, how many of us have done the same kind of things, Bill did. My judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. Drink was taking an important, exhilarating part in my life. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in, th in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair-weather friends. And here's Bill now back in New York City on top of the heap. He's making money for himself and a lot of other people. He's drinking also, but drinking is not a problem right now. It's a very exciting thing, and Bill is really, really, really becoming a success at what he wanted to be. We also know, though, that if he's alcoholic, his drinking is going to get worse because it is a progressive thing. Let's see where he goes now from the top of the heap. He said, my drinking assumed a more serious proportions, containing all day and almost every night. The remonstrances of my friends terminated in a round. I became a lone wolf. How many of us have done the same thing, Bill? But people are going to say, Bill, you're drinking too much. Bill, you're costing us money. Bill, why don't you cut back? Bill, why don't you quit? And once again, rather than even consider that, Bill said, to hell with them. I don't need them. He begins to operate on his own now. I have no problem identifying with Bill Wilson. See, there were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity, for loyalty to my wife helped at times by extreme drunkenness kept me out of those scrapes. And I've always believed about everything Bill wrote, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you see, we have a book in AA called As Bill Sees It, and now and on they have a book called As Lois Remembers. <laughs> a whole lot different. <laughs> They're not exactly the same either. Let's go over to page four, first paragraph. Now here's old Bill. He's making lots of money. He's doing well. He's got lots of willpower, lots of hope for the future, hardworking, optimistic, a self-made man. On page four, it said, Abruptly in October 1929, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock, five hours after the market had closed. The ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of tape which bore the inscription XYZ32. It had been 52 that morning. He said, I was finished, and so were many friends. The papers reported men jumping to the death from towers of high finance. He said, that disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. <laughs> Bill had a solution for that, didn't he? My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock, Was well, so what? Tomorrow was another day. And as, as I drank, that old fierce determination to win came back. How many of us have done the same thing? Could come out of the jailhouse, the divorce court, the hospital, or wherever, low, sad, depressed, stop off in the bar, have a couple of drinks, and as the alcohol courses through our veins, we say, we'll show them. By God, they're not going to treat us that way. And we're off and we're running again. That old fierce determination to be somebody to show them. Next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left and thought I'd better go to Canada. You know, Bill was a drunk. He wasn't stupid. He knew where the money was, so he went to Canada. By the following spring, we were living in our custom style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba, no Saint Helena for me. But drinking caught up with me again. My generous friend had to let me go, and this time we stayed broke. Now we see our drinking progressing to the point where we can no longer even hold a job. We went to live with my wife's parents. I found a job, then lost it as a result of a brawl with a taxi driver. Mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work at a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. I became an unwelcome hanger-on at brokerage places, people at where he used to be the fair-haired boy, where he used to make lots of money for lots of people. He goes in there now, and they say, and Bill, we'd rather you didn't come in here today. You're about half drunk, and you don't look good, and you're smelling bad. You're embarrassing in front of our customers. Please move right on down the street. Certainly, certainly, we can see the progression of alcoholism. We've gone from excitement to now then we've gone to the point where it controls us completely. No longer hold a job. Nobody wants us around anymore. It starts to get worse. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Now we're drinking for an entirely different reason. We're drinking now because we absolutely have to drink in order to live. No fun left anymore. No excitement. Drinking in order to be able to live. Bathtub, chin, two balls a day, and often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars, and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. Now this went on endlessly, and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. 
A tumbler full of gin followed by a half dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. Remember last night, Dr. Silkworth said we really cannot differentiate the truth from the false. To us, what we're doing is normal. We sealed Bill's life going to hell in a handbasket already. Bill can't see that. He thinks he can still control the situation. Let's see where he goes on control. Things are real bad in Bill's life, but it says gradually things got worse. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died, and my wife and father-in-law became ill. He said, then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point in 1932, and I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender, and that chance vanished. This is a story within itself. The people who had the money knew how good Bill was at putting these deals together. And they came to Bill, and they said, Bill, we've got a proposition for you. We've got an opportunity to not only make money for us, but make money for you. And if you can stay sober, we'd like for you to handle this thing. And Bill said, don't you worry about that drinking. He said, I'm through with that drinking. You'll not have to worry about that. And he worked for a matter of months putting this deal together. And a few days before it was to be successfully completed, one night, they're all sitting around in a hotel room talking about this. Somebody passes around a bottle of Applejack. This was back during the days of Prohibition. It came to Bill, and he said, no, thank you. I'm not drinking anymore. After a while, it came back to him, and the guy next to him said, Bill, you don't understand what this is. He said, this is the finest Applejack in the world. It is called Jersey Lightning. You better have a drink. And Bill's mind said, hmm, I've never tasted any Jersey Lightning. (laughs) No more thought than that. He reached out, grabbed the bottle, took a drink, triggered the allergy, couldn't sober up, blew the whole deal. Now, the importance in it lies within the next statement. He said, I woke up. This had to be stopped. I I saw that I could not take as much as one drink. I was through forever. Before then, I'd written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. For the first time, Bill could differentiate the truth from the false. For the first time, he could truly see what alcohol was doing to him, and he did just like all the rest of us. He trotted out his willpower, and he said, Sick em, Will. We're through with that drink, and we'll never drink again as long as we live. You know, they tell us, try to tell us we are weak will people. Don't you believe that? We are strong will people. Weak will people do not become alcoholic. Third time they vomit, they quit drinking. <laughs> alcoholic knows there's got to be some way to drink without puking. We damn near kill ourselves, you know. We got lots of willpower. See, but Bill doesn't know what we learned last night. Anytime there's a battle going on between the willpower and the obsession of the mind, the obsession of the mind is stronger than willpower, and it'll always win. That's how strong it is. Let's see what happened to him on willpower. He said, shortly after, I came home drunk. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way, and I'd taken it. He said, was I crazy? See, if his willpower is not working, then he begins to question his sanity. Am I just crazy? Is that it? He said, I begin to wonder for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. Now, renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed, and confidence began to be replaced by cocksuredness. He said, I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. One day, I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time, I was beating on the bar, asking myself how it happened. And as the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I would manage better next time. But I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. Anybody in here identify with Bill Wilson? Huh? He said, the remorse and horror and hopeless of the next morning are unforgettable. Can you guys hear him from the back? Can you hear back there okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my voice is a little low here this morning. Okay, where am I? All right. Laughlin, <laughs> <laughs> Nevada. I got, a one, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a wonderful memory. It's just short. <laughs> he said, the remorse and horror and hopeless of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably. There there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck. For it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again, but so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. 
then a mental fog settled down. Jen would fix that, so two bottles in the oblivion. See, Bill questioned, his, he used his willpower, and that didn't work. He began to question his sanity, and that didn't work. And then he began to contemplate suicide. And then he was drinking for the sickest effect of all, total oblivion. And that's where we find Bill at this time. He said, the mind and body are a marvelous mechanism, for mine endured this agony two more years. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again, I, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. There were flights from city to country and back as I, and my wife and I sought escape. Then came the night when the physical and mental torture was so hellish, I feared I'd burst through my window, sash and all. Sometime I, somehow I managed to drag my mattress to the lower floor lest I suddenly leap. A doctor came with heavy, heavy sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. This combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity, and well, so did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. So now we find Bill drinking for oblivion, not eating very often. I can identify with Bill. He's dying of malnutrition, and I, I can identify with Bill because when I was drinking in those last years of my drinking, occasionally I'd eat a bologna sandwich because I knew you're supposed to eat something rather than just drink. And that's what Bill was doing at this time, dying of malnutrition. My brother-in-law is a physician. And through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. This is the town's hospital in New York City, and this is the summer of 1933. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Belladonna was a drug that they used to fool the body into thinking it had alcohol in it. It was used for withdrawal purposes. It's what they use Valium for today. Hydrotherapy and mild exercise help much. Hydrotherapy is a water treatment. We saw some of that in a treatment center in Australia back in the 1980s. They would put the alcoholic on a gurney, roll him into the shower room, and they had shower heads all the way around the shower room alternating hot and cold water. Be in there for about 30 minutes. Doesn't cure alcoholism, but it makes a clean drunk out of you, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> Those guys that come out of there and their skin all wrinkled up and shriveled up. He said, best of all, I met a kind doctor. Now, this is Dr. Silkworth, who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I'd been seriously ill bodily and mentally. Silky sat down with him and explained his ideas about the physical allergy and the obsession of the mind. And here's the effect it had on Bill. He said, it relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. For the first time, Bill understood his problem. He knew it was not willpower. He knew it wasn't moral character and sin. He knew it was a physical allergy coupled with an obsession of the mind, and that's what made him absolutely powerless. And he said, now that I know what's wrong with me, I'll not have to drink any longer. Let's see where he goes from here. The information we learned last night about the doctor's <clears throat> opinion and the illness of alcoholism is very, very important information. But, you know, it's just information. It will not solve alcoholism just because we know what the problem is, as Bill found out. But it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. And after a time, I returned to the hospital. Now, this is the summer of 1934. A year later, we go back into the towns for the second time. He said, this was the finish, the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. Bill was laying in the hospital room. They're all sick. He overheard Lois and Dr. Silkworth talking. She said, Dr. Silkworth, is there any hope for him? And he said, no, I don't believe so, Lois. We'll have to give him over to the undertaker of the asylum because there's no solution for Bill. And he said, they did, they did not need to tell me. He said, I knew and I almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities and my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to, to plunge into the dark, joining that endless possession of solitude gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all, 
what would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. Bill was a very hardworking, op- optimistic individual, and now we see Bill, he is hopeless. He is without hope. And we all know you can't live long without hope. You've got to have hope. But Bill is hopeless at the moment. Now let's look at this next statement very carefully. He said, No words can tell of the lonely and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. I've never seen a better description of step one. No step one written in those days, but surely this is where Bill took it. He admitted complete defeat. Alcohol had whipped him in a fair fight. He was completely powerless over alcohol. Now, if that should happen to you and I today, chances are we would say, well, that being the case, I guess I better go to AA. But Bill didn't have any AA to go to. He's in the best facility he knows of. So even though he's admitted his powerlessness, even though he's taken what we know is step one, the only thing he can do is leave that hospital, try to stay sober on his own. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. And in Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted in what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen, and I imagine it was a pretty bleak November. He started drinking on November the 11th, triggered the allergy, couldn't stop, been drunk now for about three weeks. With a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night to the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of her bed. I would need it before daylight. My musing was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. Now, this was Ebby Thatcher. And Bill and Ebby had gone to school together when they were younger, did lots of drinking together. And Bill knew about Ebby, and he knew how Ebby drank. And he said he was sober. And if you'll notice, that's in squiggly writing. <laughs> Squiggly writing in the big book is very important. This really amazed Bill. Ebby's sober. He said, well, it was years since I remember coming to New York in that condition. I was amazed. Rumor had it that he hadn't been committed for alcoholic insanity. The last Bill had heard about Ebby is Ebby was going to be committed to the state insane asylum in the state of Vermont for alcoholic insanity. That's what they used to do with people like us before we had the treatment centers. They'd haul us in front of a judge. The judge would commit us to the state insane asylum for alcoholic insanity for an undetermined period of time. Till you got well. You were stay there until you got well. And that's the last he had heard about Ebby. He said, I wondered how, it ha- how he'd escaped. He was amazed that Ebby was out of this treatment center, or uh, insane asylum, excuse me. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> They've renamed everything, you know, these yeah. days. <laughs> they talk about dis- dysfunctional families today. Well, mine was just crazy as hell. I don't know. <laughs> but Abby, Abby come from a, a very prominent family in Albany, New York. In fact, his father was the mayor of Albany. Very prominent family. And Abby's drinking was embarrassing the family. So they called Ebby in one day and said, Ebby said, you're embarrassing the family with your drinking. We would like for you to just basically get out of town. And going over there to Vermont and stay at the old summer place, and we'll be over there this summer. And while you're there, you might as well sober up. And if you get sober, you might as well make yourself useful and paint up and fix up the old summer place because we'll be using it. So Ebby went out, got out of town and went over to Vermont. He began to fix up the old summer place, painting and fixing up. And one day he finished painting this wall. And he looked at it, and he was admiring that. And he noticed that some pigeons were doing some things on the side of his wall that he didn't like. So he went in the house and got his shotgun out and began to shoot at the pigeons, blowing holes in the side of the wall. (laughs) Well, the neighbors, they don't like that at all. So they called the police, and they had him arrested, and they took him before the judge, and they were going to commit him for alcoholic insanity. But Abby got real lucky. Two fellows interceded on his behalf. 
One guy's name was Roland Hazard. The other one was Zebra Graves. And they asked the judge if they might release Ebby to their care because they were going to the Oxford group, and they felt if they took Ebby to the Oxford group meetings and if he would apply the tenets of the Oxford group to his life, maybe he too could stay sober as they had. Well, Ebby began to go to the Oxford group meetings, and he began to stay sober. And a couple of months later, he goes to New York to the Calvary Mission, which was the headquarters of the Oxford group at that time. And he began to stay there in that mission. And after a while, he decided that he remembered his friend Bill. He said, I think I'll go over and talk to Bill. Maybe I can help Bill stay sober, as these two fellows had helped me. Now, Bill didn't know any of this, though. He said, I wondered how he'd escaped. Of course, he would have dinner, and I could drink opity with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we'd chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility, the very thing an oasis. Drinkers are like that. The door opened, and he stood there fresh-skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table, and he refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered what got into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come, what's all this about, I queried. And he looked straight at me simply but smilingly. He said, I've got religion. Now, I'm damn glad that didn't happen in my kitchen. <laughs> I have no idea what I would have done. But here's what Bill did. He said, I was aghast. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yeah, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. <laughs> but he didn't know ranting. In a matter-of-fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea. Which is step two. And a practical program of action. Which is steps three through twelve. That was two months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. So now then, Bill knows all three things. He got the problem from Dr. Silkworth. He got the solution here referred to as a simple religious idea from Ebby. He got the practical program of action from Ebby. So now he knows all three things. But Bill is also just like so many of us. He did not like this simple religious idea. You know, Bill's thoughts and his ideas about God and about religion and etc., were enough that made him resent what Ebby had brought to him. He said he'd come to pass his experience along to me if I cared to have it. I was shocked but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be for I was hopeless. He talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folk and their doings. His insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen. You know, Bill's grandfather, Grandpa Griffith, raised him from 12 years on. And Grandpa Griffith believed in some power greater than human power, but he wouldn't let anybody tell him how he had to, to believe in it. He had a, his grandpa had a great problem with the world's religions. He'd passed that along to Bill. His fearlessness, he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past, and they made me swallow hard. That wartime day in old Winchester Cathedral came back again. And where Bill's having a problem now with this religious idea that Ebby's talking about. We've seen him take step one. In the next couple of pages, we're going to see him take step two. Let's see how he came to be able to to accept this religious idea. Yeah, Bill has already took step one, so now he's between steps one and two. He hasn't took steps two yet. He began to ponder these things. He said, I always believed in the power greater than myself. I'd often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith in the strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists suggest vast laws and forces at work. But despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much precise and immutable law and no intelligence? He, I, I simply had to believe in the spirit of the universe who knew neither time nor limitation. But that was as far as I had gone. Now here's where I really began to identify with Bill Wilson. With menace in the world's religions, I parted right there. 
when they talked of a God personal to me who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, he said, I became irritated and my mind snapped shut against such theories. To Christ I see the certainty of a great man, not too closely followed by those who claimed him. His moral teachings, most excellent. For myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. <laughs> the rest I disregarded. Anybody in here identify with Bill Wilson? Huh? You betcha. We can see that Bill's having a terrible time with this religious idea. Now let's go down to the middle paragraph. But my friend sat before me, and he made the point back declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. Then he had, in effect, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Had this power originated in him? Obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and this was none at all. This is where the identification process is so important. Bill knew about Ebby. He knew how Ebby drank. And he knew that if Ebby had been sober two months... Some power greater than Ebby had to be working in Ebby's life. Whether Bill likes it or not is absolutely beside the point. Ebby is living proof of it. And that's what you and I offer to the newcomer. You know, when we sit there talking to a newcomer, we're living proof that some power greater than human power is working in our lives also. Whether the newcomer likes it or not is beside the point. We are the proof of it. Ebby was the proof for Bill. Now, I'd like to have been there that day sitting in a corner watching them. Bill's about two-thirds drunk. Ebby has come out of the Oxford groups, and they were a group of people practicing first-century Christianity to the best of their ability. The terms they used were highly religious in nature. Ebby is on fire, and he's talking about God. And Bill don't like it at all. <laughs> and they're sitting there arguing with each other about who God is and what He is. And Bill said, don't give me that religious crap. Oh, yeah, I believe in a great mind, a spirit of nature, but don't give me that other kind of stuff. And Ebby's trying to put it on old Bill, and they're arguing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Let's go over to page 12, first paragraph. He said, despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. Bill still doesn't like this idea. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy. When the thought was expressed that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. He said, I didn't like the idea. I could go for such conception of creative intelligence, universal mind, or spirit of nature. But I resisted the thought of the czar of the heavens, however loving his way might be. I have since talked with scores of men who felt the same way. In other, in other words, Bill was saying there's got to be a harder way to do this. <laughs> what you're saying is too simple. Now, I guess Ebby finally, finally got tired of this deal. Let's look at the next statement very carefully. If you'll notice, it's in squiggly writing. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, well, why don't you choose your own conception of God? In other words, he said, Bill, what are we arguing about? What difference does it make what we call him? Why don't you choose your own conception of God? And we're no longer dealing with religion now. We're dealing with spirituality. You see, religion says this is the way you have to believe. Spirituality says it really doesn't make any difference how you believe. The only question is, are you willing to believe? So we're, we're through with religion. Now we're talking about spirituality. And here's the effect that it had on Bill. That statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain whose shadow I'd lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. It took all arguments away from him. He couldn't argue with that statement. He said, It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. Surely this is when Bill took step two. No step two written in those days. But here's where he came to believe in a power greater than himself based on every simple little statement, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And that statement has opened the door for countless millions of we alcoholics who were having trouble with religion. And I think the reason it really works is we're allowed here to have our own conception of God. And you know, as I look back at my lifetime, I realize I've never had any problem with my own conception of anything. <laughs> you betcha. Let me believe the way I want to, and I'm ready to go now. Bill is now taking a step two. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? When he made the statement, 
I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. This is Bill's first reference to a wonderfully effective spiritual structure. And he's going to start painting a picture in our mind using words. Eventually he'll tell us what the structure is and show us where we'll pass through it to freedom. Now his first reference to it is, Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my, fr- in my friend. The foundation of this structure is willingness. That came from step one. When we could see that what we were doing would no longer work, period, we became willing to change. Later on, we're going to see where believing, step two is the cornerstone of that structure. And eventually, he'll tell us exactly what it is. A beautiful way to teach painting pictures in our mind using words. If we are willing, and if we believe, then we've already started the road to recovery. Bill has now taken steps one and two. Immediately... Abby starts taking him to Oxford group meetings. But remember, Bill's still drinking. Triggered the allergy on November the 11th, he can't stop. On about December the 10th, probably, 1934, Bill was put back in the hospital for the third time for withdrawal from alcohol by Dr. Silkworth. Abby comes to visit with him. They begin to apply the little Oxford group program of action, and Bill had his spiritual experience. Let's look on page 13. Let's see if we can't see the last ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's taken one and two. Let's see if we can't see the last ten. He said, at the hospital I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise, so I showed signs of delirium tremens. There I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him, to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. The first tenet that the Oxford group had was surrender. Now, Bill, later on, when he wrote the steps, he realized that no alcoholic would like the word surrender. So he changed their first step into our third step where we made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God as we understand Him. We see him there taking the first Oxford group tenet, which turned out to be our step three. He's now taken one, two, and three. He said, I ruthlessly faced my sins. I ruthlessly faced my sins. Their second tenet was examine your sins. And Bill knew that no good alcoholic is going to do that. So he changed that into made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. He's taking step four there. And became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. I've not had a drink since. Became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. You'll notice friend is capitalized. This is one of the words that Bill uses for God. And that little statement became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch, later became step six and seven. We became willing to have God remove these things and humbly ask him to do so. There we're dealing with six and seven. My schoolmate visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. He's taking what we know today as step five there in the town's hospital with Abby. We made a list of people I'd hurt and toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals, admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. They had an Oxford group tenant called Restitution. And Bill knew no self-respecting alcoholic is on a due restitution. So he took that and made two steps out of it, step eight and nine, where we made the list and became willing and then made amends. There he's dealing with eight and nine. He said, I was to test my thinking by the new God conscious within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. That statement later became step 10, where we continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly explained it. I mean, admitted it. (laughs) That's the new step 10. (laughs) I would sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. And there we see all the elements of step 12, where we sought through prayer and medica- med- meditation <laughs> Step 11. to improve our conscious contact with God, so on and so forth. There he's dealing with step 11. I'm sorry, step 11. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. That's got to be the first part of step 12 having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So we see Bill in the town's hospital applying the Oxford group tenets 
which later he made into the last ten steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is why he was able to say and how it works, these are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. Bill took them in the town hospital with the help of Ebby. Now let's see what happened to him. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. Simple, but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant the destruction of self-centeredness. And I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. Poor old alcoholics got to give up the two most important things in our lives. And the first thing is our alcohol, and the second thing is our self-centeredness. The two very things Very difficult the to do. Very difficult, but very simple. Yeah. He said, these were revolutionary and drastic proposals. But the moment I accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity as I'd ever known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. And for a moment I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor and asked if I was still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. You know, Bill overheard Lois and, and Dr. Silkworth talking, so he thought he'd gone crazy. He thought he'd check out with Dr. Silkworth to see if he had gone crazy. Finally, after he told me his experience, finally he shook his head saying, Well, something's happened to you I don't understand, but you better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way that you were. The good doctor now sees many men who had such experiences. He knows that they are real. Now, we don't know what happened to Bill that day. We were not there to see that. But we know this was probably about December the 14th of 1934. We do know that Bill didn't die until January of 1971. We do know that it was never necessary for him to take another drink from this day until the day that he died. Something profound took place in his life that day. Bill always said... I had a vital spiritual experience as the result of these steps during which old ideas were cast aside and replaced with a new set of ideas and I was able able to live the rest of my life without drinking. Now here's a guy that went in the hospital selfish and self-centered to the extreme always doing what he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it. That was his attitude when he went in there. Let's look at his attitude now that he's had the spiritual experience. He said, while I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, in turn, might work with others. Bill had that gigantic spiritual experience, and then he immediately begins to think how he can give it to other people. Something profound happened with Bill. He said, my friend, and this time you'll notice it's a small f, he's referring to Ebby now, My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again, and if he drank, he would surely die then faith would be dead indeed, and with us it's just like that. Thank God Bill knew that and accepted that fact. Because when he was in Akron about to get drunk, he remembered how back in New York City, even though he'd never helped anybody else, that he himself had felt better. That's why he got hold of Dr. Bob, to try to help Dr. Bob, not necessarily to sober up Bob, but to keep Bill from getting drunk. And thank God it kept him from getting drunk, and Bob sobered up, And from there, we had the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Faith without works is dead. And you know, just about anybody I see drink today that's been in AA for any period of time, usually they have quit working with other people. And when they quit working with other people, they start thinking about self only. And after a while, all the old problems come back, and we end up getting drunk all over again. Always working with others will help us when nothing else will. He said, my wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution to their problems. It was fortunate for my old business associates remained skeptical for a year and a half, during which I found little work. I was not too well at the time, and I was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink, but I soon found when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Many times I've gone to my old hospital in despair, on talking to a man there, I'd be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It's a design for living that works in rough going. We've took a design for living that works in rough going and turned it into a non-drinking society, I'm afraid. 
This is a design for living. And the work is really, really hard, but the pay is really, really good, too. We managed to stay sober. Isn't that something? Now, if we're a brand-new alcoholic out here in California, no fellowship around us, first contact we've ever had is this book called Alcoholics Anonymous. We've read the doctor's opinion. We've been able to see what our problem is. We've read Bill's story. We've been able to identify with another alcoholic. We've seen him go from fun drinking to drinking because of absolute necessity, going finally to the sickest of all, complete oblivion. Then we've seen him recover from that condition. Now surely, surely, we could say to ourselves, we're enough like this guy, that if he can recover, just maybe we could too. The beginning of belief, the beginning of hope, By now, we could probably hardly wait to see what really did take place in Bill's life and how he recovered. And I don't think it's by accident the very next chapter is titled, There is a Solution. There is a solution to the the thing that Bill has really described in his own story here and to what Dr. Silkworth has talked to us about it. Now, if our problem is powerless, which we should be convinced of that by now, then obviously the answer is going to lie within power. We do know that it was never necessary for him to take another drink from this day until the day that he died. Something profound took place in his life that day. Bill always said, I had a vital spiritual experience as the result of these steps during which old ideas were cast aside and replaced with a new set of ideas and I was able, able to live the rest of my life without drinking. Now, here's a guy that went in the hospital, selfish and self-centered to the extreme. And in this chapter, there is a solution. We're going to talk about two powers. We're going to talk about the power of the fellowship, and we're going to talk about the power of the vital spiritual experience. And if we who are powerless could get both of these powers in our lives, then maybe we could overcome alcoholism also. On page 17... For those who are powerless, he writes the prescription. Here he talks about the two powers. Abby presented Bill with a solution, and now Bill's going to present us with a solution in the same way. He said, there is a solution. As a friend of mine back home says, there's many different types of solutions as there are people in AA. And I say, if you look at the chapter heading on page 17, it'll tell you how many solutions there are. There is a solution, one. He said, we, and there's that big word again. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. Said we are average Americans. Today we can say that we're average citizens of the world because of my last count there was a AAs in 154 countries around the world. So all sections of this country and its occupations are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix. And I think that we're probably the most mixed-up group of alcoholics in the world here this morning, (laughs) here in Laughlin, Nevada. You know, if we didn't have Alcoholics Alcoholics Anonymous to talk about or drinking and recovery therefrom, I wonder what we would drink about, talk about. There's hardly anything. (laughs) (laughs) Told you I had a good memory. It's just short. (laughs) We wouldn't wouldn't have anything to talk about. But it says that we are people who normally would not mix. But there exists among us a fellowship and a friendliness which is indescribably wonderful. And I hear that this morning and before the meeting. All the talk and the laughter and the going on, that's the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got sober on the spirit of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was the only thing keeping me here. So it's a powerful thing. The fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous kept me sober for quite some time. Now he's going to describe this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. By talking about something, he already assumes that we know about it, or he he thinks we already know about it. And all great teachers have always done this. When they wanted to teach you something new, they would talk to you first about something you already know and use that as an example to teach you something new. You know, we had a great teacher that lived 2,000 years ago, and he was really good at this. When he wanted to teach something to a shepherd, he he would tell him a story about sheep. But if he wanted to teach the same thing to the fisherman, he would change his story. This time it would be about fish. Then when he went to the farmer, he talked about cattle and grains. All good teachers do this. Bill is going to use the example 
of the great passenger ship. He said, we are like the passengers of a great liner. The moment after rescue from shipwreck when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. You know, Bill is referring to a time in the 30s when your mode of transportation from one continent to another was by the great ocean liners. And on those great ocean liners, they had what they called the steerage section. And people who were immigrants that didn't have very much money, they usually booked passage in the steerage section, way down in the bowels of the ship, very little fresh air, dormitory-style living. I called it the cheese sandwich section, not very good down there. Now, if you had a little more money, though, and you wanted better accommodations, you could pay for fourth class and come up a deck or two. Then you could go third class and come up another deck or two. Then you could go second class and come up another deck or two, and each time the accommodations and the food were better. If you had enough money, you could go in what they call first class. In first class, they had big, fine state rooms. They had great dining rooms. They had good food, fine waiters, access to fresh air all the time. But that still wasn't the most elite place on the ship. If you had the right kind of money... Old, old money. Old money. (laughs) If you had the right religion, the right ethnic background, the right everything, you might be invited to dine at the captain's table. Just a few select people could do that. And at the captain's table, you had the best of everything. The best service, the best food, the best everything. Now, it's a long, long ways from the captain's table to the steerage section. And in the journey across the ocean... Those two people should never have met each other. In fact, most of those ocean liners even had separate stairwells. So the first-class people never even had to see those who rode in the steerage section. They had nothing whatsoever in common. Then I think about the Titanic. And the night it hit the iceberg. And these two guys are standing there at the rail of the ship. And one of them got his tuxedo on his shiny shoes and his little bow tie and everything that goes with it. Standing next to him is the guy from the steerage section. Got his old work overalls on, his old brogans, never wore a tie in his life. These guys had nothing whatsoever in common with each other until they jumped overboard. And when they jumped overboard and their butts hit that cold water, (laughs) they had something in common. (laughs) How in the hell do we save ourselves? And they grabbed on to each other and held on to each other. And I doubt very seriously if the man from the captain's table asked for a financial statement from the man from the steerage section. (laughs) And when these two guys were rescued and got back on another ship or back on land, there was a feeling amongst them which was indescribably wonderful. This has always been true. When people escape from a common peril, there is a feeling that ties them together, and it's one of the greatest feelings in the world, and that's what we got in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't care who you are. We don't care where you came from. We don't care how much money you got. We don't care what your education is. We don't care what your ethnic background is, what your religion is, or anything else. All we want to know is, are you an alcoholic? And if you are... There is a feeling amongst us which is indescribably wonderful. Even though we are so different from each other, we are still bound together. Now watch him. He's going to give us a warning. Unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joy and escape from disaster did not subside as we go our individual ways. These two guys, when they finally got back on shore, they looked at each other. They said, well, we really don't belong together. And they separated, probably never to meet again. But we will always be alcoholic. And this feeling we have for each other never goes away. And we find it again in city after city after city and country after country. One of the greatest things I've been able to experience in my lifetime is to go to an AA meeting in a foreign country and feel just exactly as good as I did at home. Even though I don't know those people, we are bound together because we're alcoholics. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element of the powerful semen which binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. In other words, this feeling we have for each other in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the things that bind us together. But then he said that itself is not enough. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. 
We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. Not the news of the fellowship, but the news of the common solution. And later on we're going to see where the common solution is the spiritual experience brought about through the program of action. Now if we could get the power of the fellowship which supports us and helps us And if we could get the power of the spiritual experience which changes us and add the two together, then that will be enough power to overcome our powerlessness over alcohol and we can recover from that condition. I think one of the greatest tragedies that I see in the world today, and there's lots of tragedies going on in the world today, one of the greatest that I see is we people who are in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous are spending literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of men and women work hours, trying to attract other alcoholics to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, when we've got thousands and thousands who are already members of Alcoholics Anonymous who are sitting around dying from untreated alcoholism because they're doing nothing about the common solution. And the reason they're doing nothing about the common solution is nobody's telling them about it. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's saying, look, here's the program of action. Nobody's saying, let me take you by the hand and walk with you so you can have a spiritual experience. And they're fellowship only, and after a while they go back to drinking. And they said, well, AA don't work for us. No, they didn't work for AA. They didn't do the program. And again, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Because we're not insisting that new people work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and we're letting them die around us. Thousands of us are dying every day who are already members of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think it's our responsibility to see that every newcomer knows about page 17 and knows there's two powers, the power of the fellowship and the power of the spiritual experience. And we're not going to recover without both of them. Now, we might stay sober for a while, But we're not going to recover from alcoholism without both of them. No more preaching today. (laughs) Guarantee you that. Preached a little last night. Preached just a little bit this morning. We'll try not to preach anymore. (laughs) A good textbook never tells you anything but what it doesn't back it up and prove it. The first half of this chapter is designed to show you and I why fellowship alone is not sufficient. The last half of this chapter is used to show us the solution to alcoholism, the vital spiritual experience. Let's look for just a few minutes at why fellowship alone is not sufficient, and then we'll take a break. Let's go to page 20. He said, you may already have asked yourself why it is so all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. Now, if you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, well, what do I have to do? It's the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. Remember last night we talked about precisely, specifically, with clear-cut directions. Well, here's one of those words. We shall tell you what we've done. Before going into detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. Now, how many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone, why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman and quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try a beer and wine and lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observational drinkers which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. Now, we're going to look at two kinds of drinkers that these expressions that Joe just read would refer to them. So moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Remember we talked about them last night? They have a couple of drinks. They get a slightly tipsy, out-of-control beginnings of a nauseous feeling. Alcohol is no big deal for them. If they have any problems with it, they simply leave it alone. Those expressions that Joe read would certainly refer to the moderate drinker. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally, and it may even cause him to die a few years before his time. Now, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, 
falling in love, change of environment, or the warnings of a doctor becomes operative, if they do, this man can stop all or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need a little medical attention. Now, we call this guy the heavy or the hard drinker. They drink like we alcoholics drink, but they are not alcoholic. If a good enough reason presents itself to them, they'll do one or two things. They may learn to moderate their drinking. They do not have the physical allergy. They may quit drinking entirely and stay quit. They do not have the obsession of the mind. They drink like us, but they're not alcoholic, and you and I see them all the time. They're the guy that said, when I was in the service, I was an alcoholic also. But when I got out of the service, I got married, went to church, quit drinking, don't see why in the hell you can't. No, they're not alcoholic. The expressions that Joe read in the beginning would refer to the heavy drinker. But what about the real alcoholic? Now, he may start off as a moderate drinker, which many of us did. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. Some of us stayed periodic. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Now then, we're going to describe the real alcoholic. And when you see a description in there that fits you, would you please raise your hand? We'd like to see if we're in a room full of real alcoholics. He said, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. Mm -hmm. Charlie talked last night about... (laughs) He talked last night about crossing over that line. He talked last night about crossing over that line, but I don't know what line he was talking about, but I know one thing, I was drunk when I went over it. Okay, now here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more or less insanely drunk. Anybody like that in here? You betcha. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. I always get good looking and out of debt as soon as I start drinking. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world. You let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. We got any of those people in here? He has a positive genius for getting tied at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement. Anybody like that in here? Always getting drunk at the wrong time. Now, everybody holds their hand up on this one. He's often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. (laughs) But in that respect, he's incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often possesses special ability, skills, and aptitudes and has a promising career ahead of him. Anybody like that in here? I've never heard anybody but an alcoholic say that, though. I've never heard an Al-Anon say it yet. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself. Then he pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. Anybody like that in here? He's, yeah. a, he's the fellow who goes t- to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep the clock around. Yet early the next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. Any bottle hiders in here? Yeah. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. Anybody spread them around wherever you might be? Phyllis and I used to buy a lug of whiskey, which is three-fifths, and one to share and one to hide from each other. <laughs> As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Anybody ever have to have a little something in the morning? Then comes a day when he simply cannot make it and gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative to wish to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and treatments, or excuse me, sanitariums. Never did taper off. I always tapered on for some reason. I don't know. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as her behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. You know, if our government has ever done anything right in the field of alcoholism, it's an education of the public as to what alcoholism is and what it isn't. Because of that, a lot of the stigma has been removed from alcoholism. Many, many people are getting to us today before they have to do everything here that describes the real alcoholic. But I'll guarantee you, if you're a real alcoholic, you found yourself in there somewhere. At least one of them are going to fit you. In my case, practically every one of them. One in particular. Seven years after I got sober, I sold a 40-acre, 45,000 broiler chicken operation. For years after that, Every once in a while, I would run into the guy that bought it, and sometimes he would wave and smile and say, Hey, Charlie, we have found another one. 
and he's referring to partially empty vodka bottles. Yeah. Behind corner posts, under rocks, hollow trees, falling out of feed bins. Hell, he found them for years in there. Now, here's the question. Why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all his attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? The moderate drinker can. The heavy drinker can. Why can't the alcoholic? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters? Perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We're not sure why once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. We know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both in a bodily and mental sense which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. Now, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Would you read that again, please? Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Now, we must remember that always... Just before we take the first drink, we are stone cold sober. Or stark raving sober. Or stark raving sober, one of the two. (laughs) And the real problem centers in our mind telling us we can drink while sober rather than in the body that ensures that we can't drink. Chances are you'll never go put your hand on a hot stove again to see if it'll burn you the second time. You know, I remember as a kid growing up back in the Depression years, and there's there's a few of you in here old enough to remember that, too. And back in the 1930s, we didn't have very much. We didn't have hot and cold running water. We didn't have forced air heat. Joe said his family was not so poor they had to live in a tent, but he said, by God, if we'd had the money, we'd have lived in a tent. That's about how bad it was. <laughs> but I remember in those days, even though you didn't have anything, you were very poor people. Cleanliness was still next to godliness. And every Saturday night, everybody in the family had to take a bath. Now, whether you needed a bath or not is beside the point. You still had to take one. And one night in the middle of the winter, Mother had heated the bath water on the old heating stove in the living room, put it in a number three zinc wash tub sitting behind that stove. Now, every kid in the family takes a bath in the same water. I'm the baby of the family. By the time it got to me, the crud would be about an inch thick on it. Mother said, get in there and get yourself clean. I thought to myself, how in the hell did I get clean there? But I didn't dare say that to her. You didn't talk to your parents that way in the 1930s. I scraped the crud back. I got in the tub, began to wash myself. Heating stove standing here red hot. Somehow I managed to lean over and stick my rear against that hot stove. (laughs) Burned a blister on my rear end about as big as my hand. Hurt me worse than anything had ever hurt me before. And do you know I've never had an obsession of mine to stick my ass on a hot stove <laughs> since then? I have never jerked my britches down, backed up to a stove, and said, burn me again. Now, alcohol has burned me over and over and over and over and over, just as bad as that stove ever burned me, and for some strange reason, my mind cannot remember that. Left on my own resources, I start thinking about drinking, and after a while, I think about only what it's going to do for me. That great sense of ease and comfort. That great, exciting, in-control feeling that comes from the first couple of drinks, and my mind keys in on that. I forget about the jailhouse, the hospitals, and the divorce courts, and I don't see a thing in the world wrong with taking a drink. And I take a drink, and I trigger the allergy, and I end up drunk over and over and over again. Last paragraph, page 24. So now when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. And unless locked up, may die go permanently insane. Now if we've placed ourselves beyond human aid, then the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous will not bring about recovery. 
because the fellowship is made up of a group of human beings who are just as powerless over alcohol as I am. So there's got to be a solution to that condition that we've just talked about. And page 25 gives it to us. There is a solution. Let's go to page 25. Let's begin to look at the solution. We could see that the uh, fellowship gave us enough power to support us for a while. Uh, We were told that fellowship alone is not sufficient. And then it explained why fellowship alone is not sufficient. So now on page 25, we'll start looking at the real solution to alcoholism. He said there is a solution. And almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings which the process requires for a successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others and had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life that we'd been living it. When therefore we were approached by whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up a simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. And we have found much of heaven had been rocketed into a fourth dimension of, of existence of which we had not even dreamed. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. And you notice up there it says the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences, and there's a little asterisk there referring us down to the bottom of the page. It said fully explained on Appendix 2. And later on, we'll refer to it on page 27. It says, for further amplification, see Appendix 2. And on page 47, referring to the asterisk, it says, please see Appendix 2. (laughs) They want to make... Must be important. Very important. They repeat it three times. And they're talking about spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings. And in the first printing of the book, they didn't have this little asterisk in there, and it didn't have the reference to the spiritual experience in the back of the book. And a lot of people would write into that little office to Bill and say, Bill, what do you mean by spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings? We're, not, we're doing the same things that you're doing, but we're not having the same experiences that you have. What do you mean by that? And, you know, and it was very important for me, looking back at it now that I know this, because I had this spiritual experience mixed up with a bunch of things that I learned when I was seven or eight years old. Because when I was seven or eight years old, I told myself, I said, Self? <laughs> If I ever get big enough they can't catch me, I'm not going anymore. To church, that is. And I got big enough they couldn't catch me, and I didn't go. So when I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous, I had the spiritual knowledge of a seven- or eight-year-old boy, which was practically none. And that that I did have was all mistaken and and mixed up in lots of emotionalism, things I didn't understand. The times that they would catch me, take me to that revival. They had a revival there quite often in my area, in the Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist really southern <laughs> and uh, when I would get there and, and they would be preaching all day and singing songs and having dinner on the ground and prayer meetings all day long and church way into the night bored the heck out of me but one night my aunt much and she's a big woman aunt much that's, that's the reason they called her that but aunt much kind of got in the spirit of this thing that night and she began to jump up and down and she began to talk in a strange language that I never heard of before squealing and hollering lo- rolling around in the sawdust scared the heck out of me so when this book began to talk about spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings I thought that was what I was going to have to have and I was dreading it I tell you I was but thank God for people like me who didn't know any better they put this information in the back of the book talking about spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings and this is, these is used all throughout this book and they want to make real sure that I understand what they mean by that So let's go back to page 569 and see what they mean by the term spiritual awakening and spiritual experiences. 